So we live in a world of delusion. You can create any type of illusion that you want, but on the inside, you can be suffering more than anyone on earth could ever feel or realize. If you go back, ancient cultures, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, there was always this special significance around the heart. It wasn't about linear time. It was just something inside of me could sense that something was wrong. So as I mentioned, when we're more coherent, when we're in a certain vibration, we tend to attract more of that like vibration. You become literally more magnetic. You literally have just a different type of intelligence that you have access to. So I feel a real sense of urgency now because I think the only way that we're gonna heal all this ego and separation in the world is through the heart, one heart at a time. So you have a new book, um, The Hidden Power of the Five Hearts, and it combines two of my actually favorite subjects, which is anything having to do with Paramahansa Yogananda. And this is about, you know, one of his teachers, Sri Yukteswar, and the heart. I love the heart. I talk about listening to your heart, following your heart all the time, but I'm not as well versed in the science of the heart. And, and that's what your book essentially is all about is you've done the, the deepest dive into the science. <laughs> I've been on the heart math Institute's website before, and I've, you know, sort of dabbled in that, but you've gone, you know, you've done the, the research for us heart advocates and heart aficionados. And so I'm really looking forward to, understanding more about the science and research of the heart, as well as, you know, the integration of what the ancients yes. have been saying about the heart for a long, long time. But before we get into all of that, for, for those listeners who have not yet heard our first episode, where we get deep into your backstory, your superhero origin story, let's, uh, let's do a little synopsis of you know, who you are and how you kind of found your way and how many books have you written and what's going on these days? Yeah. I mean, the journey continues like, but thank you so much. I am so excited to talk about this, which really feels like the culmination of all my prior books and everything I've been studying in wellness for over 15 years. So this is my eighth book. And my first three books were very um, physical wellness oriented, very much about nutrition and lifestyle. And then it kept expanding. I wrote an Ayurvedic book with Deepak Chopra. And then my books started to become more energetic and spiritual, but always a lot of science in them. So I am an author, as, um, as we mentioned. I have another podcast as well, which you've been a guest on called the Feel Good Podcast. I have a wellness brand, Saluna. And I would say that my journey has always been about seeking, number one, seeking to feel better in myself, which I would describe as feeling more connected, lighter, more peaceful, more fulfilled, and then really sharing that with others. So I went backpacking for three years around the world light. When I came back, I was so fired up to just share some of the amazing information that I had discovered. So I started a free blog. I was teaching yoga. I was going back to nutrition school. That's really where my journey began, sharing and sharing. That parlayed into getting book deals and getting clients and sharing with them and then sharing on national media. So it remains to this day. And what blew me away about this heart research, which is heavily scientific, but also heavily spiritual, is that I've been working in wellness for almost two decades, and no one was, is really still talking about this. That the fact that the heart is another brain, the fact that there is practical ways to access this deep intelligence which elevates our physical health, can elevate us to new levels of consciousness, not just the heart, like, oh, this feels good or vague or sentimental, but there's real, there's a real um, process for doing this, which I'm so excited to share, which happens through five stages. Um, yeah, I could go on and on, but I think that's enough of an intro for now, probably. Beautiful. All right. So um, I lived in LA, you've also lived in LA and you still uh, you know, have a residence there. And anyone who's in the wellness scene in LA has heard about or has been to the Lake Shrine and the Palisades, which is the Self-Realization Fellowship 
set up this really beautiful, I guess, shrine, yeah, worship worship place center um, in one of the most stunning parts of Los Angeles, and um, and it's all associated with Paramahansa Yogananda and his work. And if you read if you read the autobiography of a yogi. There are several mentions to Sri Yukteswar. So can you just start, let's start by talking about who this person is and how you sort of stumbled upon his, his work as it relates to the heart. Yes. Thank you, Light. So Yogananda, first of all, has had a formative impact on my life. And I first found Yogananda in India when I was backpacking and started taking a deep dive into Kriya Yoga Turns out I end up living somewhat close to Lake Shrine. So I go there quite regularly. And uh, this is where things get, you know, we talk about synchronicities. We talk about energy. I think a big part of um, expanding our life is staying really open, right? So Yogananda spoke very highly of his revered guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, who is said to be very stern, um, but had the love of a thousand mothers. And so one of the things he talks about was how tough 11 years in the ashram was with him, but how it expanded his consciousness so much. Swami Sri Yukteswar only wrote one book called The Holy Science. And I remember the first time I tried to read it, it was very esoteric. It's very succinct. It's written in shloka format. So um, just a little bit <laughs> um, out there, you could say. And he was also a Vedic astrologer. So there's a lot about like mathematical calculations. So the first time I read it years ago, I didn't really connect to it. A couple of years ago, like when I was um, researching my last book, which we spoke about, You Are More Than You Think You Are, which is about Yogananda's teachings for modern life. I started feeling this natural pull <laughs> towards Swami Sri Yukteswar. And where we are in Hawaii, there is a temple and there's um, this Hindu magazine, this yogic magazine. And I opened it up the first time I went to this temple. And there was this picture of Yogananda with Swami Sri Yukteswar. And I just had this feeling. They both want to work with me now. <laughs> like he was like coming to me, came to me in dreams. So I sat in my hammock in Hawaii for about eight or nine months reading, taking a deep dive into the holy science. And there's a part in the holy science, which I totally glossed over the first time I read the book, where he's talking about the five stages of the human heart that we all go through to awaken the heart's power. And the stages are the dark heart, the propelled heart, the steady heart, the devoted heart, and the clear heart. So I was reading and taking this deep dive light. It was just like, oh my gosh, like in the forest, sometimes three in the morning before my kids would wake up. And it was around this period that I got in touch with the Heart Math Institute. So I had read about some of the research, but I felt like, oh my gosh, I need to really connect with them. So then I reached out and they came, we did a podcast exchange. Long story short, we ended up doing a research study together called the Heart Aligned Meditation Study. And it combined some of their research with some of Yogananda's teachings. And what we found was a 29% increase in coherence in four weeks, which we can talk about in a minute, but that's basically heart, brain, nervous system communication. That's feelings of clarity and lightness and inspiration and more vitality, all these things that can be measured, but also experientially really tapping into that place of expansion that we're all looking for. So this is what blew me away, like the five stages Swami Sri Yukteswar was talking about corresponded to the science of coherence. So basically the dark heart is where your heart and your brain aren't communicating. And that corresponds to incoherence all the way to the fifth stage known as the clear heart, which is heart brain harmony. This is when we experience oneness, no separation, profound connection, miracles, synchronicities. So the science and the spiritual boom just clicked in. Look, I'm sold right on the whole thing. And um, and at the same time, for the more Western-minded uh, listener, how would someone like Swami Sri Yukteswar come across this understanding? If if he if he reveals it in the in the book, or or if you know it or not, maybe maybe you don't. I don't know. So, oh, how he actually? So he was a Vedic scholar and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was it had studied his guru was Lahiri Mahashaya. So he was, you know, he had an ashram and he was deeply steeped in this 
um, incredible intuitive knowledge. We can say all the Vedas, all the Rishis, all the seers were really, um, you know, deeply meditating, contemplating. He was, you know, a scholar in all the scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita and the, um, you know, Mahabharata and all of the texts. But what blew me away was that when I started to go deeper and deeper as well, like it wasn't just that the yogis were talking about the heart. It was, if you go back ancient cultures, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, there was always this special significance around the heart. For instance, the Egyptians didn't remove the heart when they created mummies. They would remove the brain, but they believed that the heart was an integral part of navigating the afterworld, right? And there was just this significance to the heart. It's also this, this seen as a gateway, more than a physical organ in all religions, all spiritual traditions. So we think about the sacred heart of Jesus Christ and the Heart Sutra in Buddhism. Lev, the word for heart, is written throughout the Torah. And the word kalb, which is the word for heart um, used in the Quran, I think is mentioned 132 times and the Anahata Chakra. So there's this intersection of this power center energetically and spiritually. And so we're seeing that. And then we're seeing what happens in the modern world where the ego can take over and we start to get really, we overvalue the rational, the linear, the thinking, right? The brain up in our heads, which is of course vital and important, but it's superseded in our culture in modern times, the power of the heart. So what also blew me away was, so this research was like, like some of it's like we know and it's obvious, but we forget. So as a mother, for instance, when you are pregnant and you go to the doctor and you get an ultrasound, you hear the baby's heartbeat. This is weeks before the brain is formed. So there's a higher intelligence creating this, directing this life force that doesn't need the brain, right? And so then we continue through life. And so the teachings of Swami Sri Yukteswar are talking about these heart stages. And then the heart math people are saying, hold on a second. We're studying the fact that there's 40,000 neurons in the heart and it sends more messages to the brain than vice versa. How do we create neuroplasticity with these neurons? How do we work with this independent nervous system to change our patterns, to heal trauma, to create more efficiency in our body, to elevate your vagus nerve connection, all these things, like you see in my book, there's all these charts, but it's because it's simple. You can experience this for yourself, but it's also been measured in science, which sometimes I think the discerning brain needs to see to be like, holy crap, I don't need to buy anything. I don't need to buy a device. I don't need to spend all this money on some biohacking thing. The heart is right here. It's inside of each and every single one of us. Yeah. That's what I find so interesting about this work is that you know from my understanding and my experiences is studying vedic culture you know these people these sages and gurus would sometimes be illiterate sometimes they couldn't even read and write but they would sit down and they would meditate and through the practice of repeated exposure to this kind of unified field of of pure consciousness they would cognize these ideas and and understand these principles, these universal laws of nature, which could explain, okay, this is how the heart works. This is how your energy centers work. This, they would just come out of meditation with these understandings yes. and they would teach them to their, their students. And then their students would teach them. And then, you know, 50 years ago, people in Western science start studying this stuff and, and the, the synchronicities and the, the, um, you know, the, the the way it matches up with what they've been talking about for literally thousands of years really does give a lot of credit to these practices that I think a lot of Westerners see as, uh, you know, it's kind of airy fairy or it's optional or, but you don't realize how much wisdom you can attain. And you talk about this in your book and I want to, we're going to go through each of the five stages in a moment, but you start off you start in the book talking about how your your heart had been broken many many times, and I, I, I want I want you to talk about when you were going through those various heartbreaks, right? What does that actually mean when it comes to the intelligence of the heart 
or your relationship to your heart. Because I just posted something the other day that said, your heart doesn't break, it's your expectations that break. And as your expectations yes. break, it actually gets you closer to your heart. That was a quote That's by true. Kyle Cease. Beautiful. So let's talk about that. So I like how you're framing this because I think that, um, for instance, when we're in the earlier heart stages, the dark heart, for instance, which doesn't mean evil. It just means your heart, your brain aren't talking. You're in a lot of fear. You may make fearful decisions, right? You're, you're in chaos. So that means relationships can be far more dramatic. You're picking someone maybe with missing, uh, matching trauma. We can talk about the electromagnetic field of the heart in just a moment or the propelled heart where I spent a lot of my life, which is externally oriented. This person is convenient or we look good together, or this is how I feel good by what I could show and all these things. So when my, I describe my heart being broken in some ways, having really, um, painful relationships or things not working out. It was, um, I can look back and say, oh, I was in a propelled heart stage or dark heart stage. So I wasn't really resonating in the deepest part of my wholeness and my truth and my abundance and my power. And that was reflected in the relationships I was picking in the life situations I was creating. And so it was all burning, crashing. We say, you know, this, um, in the Tao and there's other texts where it, talk about, it talks about let it burn, right? So we keep letting that burn and the pain and the breaking because what's left is what is really true. It's who we really are, right? Is that so what you mean when you say darkness is a great teacher? Is that it's teaching you the reality of the, the, real, the reality underneath the illusion of the person is the source of my happiness? So we get to the point where we realize the suffering of it's like the dark heart is like I describe in the book, we can't see across the room, right? So you bang into tables and chairs and you can't see yourself in the mirror. And so we come to this point where, and this is where you kind of move into more energy in the propelled heart where you're like, I just can't do this anymore. I don't want this to be my life. I'm tired of self-sabotaging. I'm tired of living in confusion and pain and fear right? And so you start to feel more energy. And at first it's still outwardly directed, but there's a lot more energy in the propelled heart than the dark heart. Um, so yeah, so we move through what Swami Sri Tishwar teaches. And again, the science of coherence teaches is that there's this progressive movement through the stages. Now it doesn't mean that it's linear completely and you get to one stage and you never experience dark moments because we all do. There's regression, there's more shedding of who we're not. But we learn, we actually are primarily in one stage. And I can look back and say, oh, I was really most of my life in that propelled heart stage, outwardly looking, achievement oriented, ticking things off a box, trying to control, lots of expectations, right? And then we realize as our heart awakens and we start to see more, right? In a spiritual sense, the third, as the heart awakens, this is what Swami Sri Yukteswar says too, when the heart awakens, the third eye awakens. So that means you can see yourself so much more light. So I could see, oh, oh, I could see where I created drama there. I, like I tried to project this or blame this on that person, but it was me that had all these wounds or these triggers, or it was me that came across that way in my tone, or you know, I was in hurry energy a lot or whatever I picked from this place. So we start to see more. And that's this intelligence of the heart that is not so step by step, like an instruction manual, like the, like the mind, there's a deeper intelligence that's wider. It can find more solutions. It's more expansive. And this is one of the reasons that as you awaken your heart more, you greatly increase your emotional intelligence and your ability to just create more success and forge deeper understanding with others. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the Portia Nelson poem, um, my autobiography in short in five short chapters where she start, talks about falling into a hole in chapter one and then chapter two falling into the hole, but accepting full responsibility in chapter three. Um, I forget falling into a hole and swearing. She's not going to come down that street again. And number, you know, at the end she's choosing yes. a pathway and, and, <laughs> and I, I want us to kind of hang out in the dark heart for just a little bit longer, if you don't mind, yeah. because you introduce us to a meditation technique because it's not just about understanding this intellectually. It's about doing the work to strengthen your relationship with your heart 
so that you can progress through the various stages. But my question before we get to that is, and I was trying to kind of work this out for myself when I was going through the book, is the dark heart stage, the incoherence you talked about, is that kind of like where the experience of toxic positivity would reside primarily? Meaning, you know, when people are talking, when you're in that state and you're surrounded by other people who are maybe they progress to a different stage and they're describing other experiences of more coherence and you thinking to yourself, well, that's not my experience. You're, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're shaming me and this and that and the other. Is that kind of where that term kind of lives and, and, and talk a little bit about the heart align yes. technique or, or, or some of the lifestyle changes. Cause you yes. also, you also dedicate a section of each chapter, each stage, to like very basic things that we can do to move ourselves to the next stage. Yes. So like, I'll say, first of all, thank you for that. The book is very practical. So we're talking about understanding the stages, but there's practices and tools that are evidence-based. They combine science, they combine teachings to help you transcend the dark heart and the propelled heart into deepen and to awaken. And oh my gosh, like, again, we can talk about more of the personal aspect of this in a moment. I can't tell you how much it's impacted my life. I would say my relationship with my husband is about 90% better because we came together in love, but there was a lot of dark, hard energy, old traumas, things inside of us. So there was triggers, there was misunderstandings, there was pushing each other away. And then as I came into more steadiness in my heart, which is stage three, then I was able to get into more stage four, this devoted heart, right? So it's so practical. There's an embodiment section with foods. There's research that shows that you can do these practices. Like there's one of the studies um, that shows a 23% reduction in cortisol in one month and DHEA goes up 100%. It's necessary for vitality, for fertility, for a million things. So powerful what we can do with this work. Um, So anyways, to answer your question about toxic positivity. So the dark heart is where we're like low, like we are self-sabotaging. We may hurt ourselves. We drink ourselves into oblivion. We smoke too much weed. We take drugs. We may even cut ourselves. We pick dramatic relationships, sloth energy, slothful energy, like Tomasic as Ayurveda would describe it, just on the couch. It's hard to get up. What you're describing as toxic positivity, I would actually place in the propelled heart because the propelled heart is always looking out. How do I appear to others? How can I define my other, my worth by what others think of me? This is where we only want to post really beautiful things on social media, or we want to be portrayed a certain way. We put ourselves in certain boxes. This is where judgment really comes in because the mind likes to put people in boxes. We put ourselves in boxes. We want to be seen as like a certain person. So toxic positivity means we're not authentically there, but we're trying to create a facade that we are, right? So this propelled heart is, you know, Swami Sri Teshwar describes it as the heart is propelled to seek meaning. So this is where we're trying to figure it out. And it's not that, you know, some of this stuff is bad, but we're trying to get more, more money, more fame, more followers, more achievements, like higher salary, like, hey, I want to be in this club or I want to do this or that. It's like more and more, you know, and then that's where, so funny, I used to, you know, work with a lot of celebrities and people that are in you know, in that life. And it's like, oh, that stuff really doesn't make you happy. And we hear that. But sometimes it's just amazing when you really see it. We're all struggling with the same stuff and it's nothing out here. So the part, the steady heart light is where there's a big turning point because it means we become more heart led than ego led. And this is where he talks about the necessities for the human heart have nothing to do with anything outside of yourself. This was like, whoa. So I describe in The Devoted Heart how much I realized strong attachments, especially to my first son, because it was like the most pure love I had. We create so many attachments to other people, to that job, to that situation, to what we think we need, where actually we can get to this state where, of course, we want to enjoy life with loved ones and friends, but we're self-sustaining. We can be self-reliant. The heart has this, like this torus field of energy that can continually renew and rejuvenate itself. 
And that's what the power of this work does. It gives us that incredible self-reliance. And so then we become less immersed in the Maya or the delusion of the day. So we're less irritated. We're less into controlling and time and hurry. And it has to be this way and the comparing. I mean, it's life-changing. Right? And I don't say that lightly. No fun intended. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out. And back to the show. I'm just, can I go through all the stages? You said the dark heart. The stage two is the propelled heart. Stage three is the steady heart. Then we have the devoted heart. And then finally, we have the clear heart. And you mentioned the devoted heart, um, which is where you have intuition and, and the ability to forgive. And um, just to kind of give it more uh, layers, I would love to just share or, or talk more about your experience with your business partner, because I had a similar experience with a realtor back in the early mm. 2000s where I got into, I was, my ego, it, which I wouldn't just say was, was the dominant part of my experience in that time, but I allowed it to, to, to get me into a situation where um, I ended up losing my shirt in real estate. And I was listening to this realtor who was a nice guy, but when I was sitting at the table and all the paperwork was in front of me, my heart was definitely saying, whatever you do, don't sign those papers. Yeah. And, but I overrode it, you know, with my ego saying, just kind of thinking, well, maybe I'll be the exception and maybe, yeah. you know, I'll become the next real estate mogul <laughs> and, and all these things. And of course it, um, it exploded, but some good, good things ended up coming from it regardless. So talk a little bit about your experience just to kind of flesh this devoted heart out a little more and listening to your intuition. So intuition is one of the most powerful things that we can develop for our success. And I mean, success in the broad sense, meaning that day-to-day -day decisions, including what you eat, what businesses, what business partners you pick, life partners, what you do with your time and attention, how you create that work, you know, work projects. I mean, success is a very <laughs> broad concept. And there is this inner knowing known as intuition, and we can actually learn to heighten our intuition with evidence-based science-backed techniques, and which again, correspond to the spiritual. So I'll give you the example. Back in the day, I was starting off my business and it was like, oh, this blog's growing so fast and I need to... Somehow my neighbor in New York introduced me to this tech guy and he's like, because I knew nothing and I still know nothing about tech. But he was like, yeah, we could create all this stuff. And I just remember thinking to myself or just feeling like, I was like, this guy, I don't know. It just feels like a little fast talky, like just the vibe, the energy. And so anyways, I felt like, well, who else am I going to pick? There was a little bit, as I look back of that hurry energy, I need this, right? This kind of like desperation a little bit. So I chose this person and we created some stuff, but then it just got, kept getting weirder and weirder. And it ended up that he stole a bunch of money by the time I figured it out. And then it got really messy and we had to, you know, dissolve the partnership. So it wasn't about linear time. It was just something inside of me could sense that something was wrong. And I'll give you another personal example that I share in the book. When I met my now husband, we met at a dinner party. Within 15 minutes, we knew that we were for each other. And you know, long story short, we got married in two months, which in linear time could feel really fast. But I was so clear and I was doing this hard work and it just felt like this resonance. Now, one of the things that the heart um, that um, scientifically can be measured is the heart field. So magnetometers measure magnetic fields. And so there's a field given off by your heart that's 100 times stronger than the one given off by your brain. So as I mentioned, when we're more coherent, when we're in a certain vibration, we tend to attract more of that like vibration. So this is why if we're in the dark heart light and there's just a lot of chaos and incoherence, we tend to attract 
more drama, more work situations that don't work out, relationships that don't go anywhere, whatever it is, friendships where we get screwed over, wherever it is. So what's amazing about this heart work, as we progress and we get to the devoted heart, which is where we, we become more devoted to the inner world. So it's thing, you know, unconditional love for, you know, compassion, care, living a peaceful life matter the most to us. But here's the crazy part, because we're in such a high level of coherence, things tend to work out better. And I talk about that. I talk about the devoted heart in the world of commerce and give examples of how businesses can work out better and projects because you're communicating so clearly and from this place where you're finding unity and, um, it's just such a practical way to turn on your intuition and to make better decisions. So things actually work out more and more without that pushing and that trying so much. You are just a different energy. You embody this. And this isn't like a woo-woo thing. You can measure it with scientific instruments. and You become literally more magnetic. You literally um, have just a different type of intelligence that you have access to. What about when people... You know, Obviously, you can't know what's really going on behind the scenes for stuff you see on social media. But when people, it looks like things are going well for them, but you know they have nothing. There's no consideration to their heart or, you know, any of these stages. They're just kind of like working hard, grinding, and this kind of thing. Are are you suggesting that you could do that? But if you align yourself with your heart, then you could achieve goals that also feel more aligned with your heart because just the idea of, of achieving t for the sake of achieving doesn't necessarily mean you're going to feel successful. You may look successful, but you're not necessarily going to feel successful. So we live in a world of delusion. Most of society reflects the dark heart and the propelled heart. You can create any type of illusion that you want and so in our world, ego can also take you very far to a point, right? You know, pride goeth before a fall. But on the inside, you can be suffering more than anyone on earth could ever feel or realize. You're in true darkness. You are in true, oh my gosh, I have all the money and all the fans and all the followers and everything I ever want. And I have never felt so empty and so lonely in my life. And that's almost yeah. worse because it's like you can't even achieve your anything else. You've gotten it all and you still feel that way. At least when you don't have it all, you still delude yourself into thinking, well, I just need to have more money. I just need to get, you know, more success. So not only do we live in a world of illusion, but what the Bhagavad Gita also talks about is that we're all in a sense in our own personal reality. So you have, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what is the most important thing in our life? Like, how do we define success? And I talk about this in the devoted heart. There's a different way that we can define success. And I define it as living um, more from your heart. Heart-based living means your words, your actions come from your heart. And when you live that way, it's not just like, oh, that sounds nice. You actually do feel more connected. You feel more fulfilled. You feel like, oh my gosh, like I'm connecting and supporting others and, um, you know, living this life. And then what I've experienced in my personal world is that my relationships become more successful. You know, I've been able to create this credible family, which was nothing like what I experienced growing up with so much love with my kids and my husband. We've been able to create financial abundance when we came together, you know, back in the daylight, I, I, you know, explain this. All right. Share this in this book in our last podcast. I couldn't even pay my rent in New York. It was in concrete and I longed for more nature. We were able to just keep creating. And then we bought a farm in Hawaii. We doubled it the next year. So this isn't like, you know, airy fairy stuff. There's a real practical nature. The other thing like is the heart is right here. Boom. This intelligence, this is the middle of your life. I feel like a lot of spiritual teachings and meditations are disassociative. Let me imagine I'm somewhere else to relax my body. Let me imagine I'm in a waterfall. I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying it may relax you. But what we're talking about and with the Heart Align Meditation is it brings you into your power right here in the present moment. This is where you create your highest health. This is where you create real success. 
This is where you take those opportunities. And in that moment, you walk into the room and people are drawn to you and you, you take that opportunity. You ask that person to connect. You go on that person's podcast. You meet that person, right? It's right here. So the heart is between the crown chakra and the root chakra. So we want to be up in the crown all the time. <laughs> we don't want to just be earthly. We want to be here. Both we are spiritual beings and earthly beings. It's all a continuum of energy, right? We're having this earth experience now, but the soul goes on and it goes on. So the heart is the gateway, the gateway to our highest potential. And so for me, um, you know, who has been meditating for over 15 years, what I loved about this work and learning the science as well to show that it all, it's not, oh, I choose science or I choose spiritual. It's both when it comes to this heart work. When we use these techniques and in the heart aligned meditation that you described that we did the study with heart math, some of this research was published in the, um, the American Journal of Cardiology simply by shifting some of our attention to our heart, which we can do right now here, like you and me talking. I'm fully present with you, but far, part of my attention is on my heart. That actually rewires your nervous system. That alone starts to create different neural circuitry between your heart, your brain, and your nervous system. Now we're coming into a more deep, calm, expanded, grounded place we're cha making changes physiologically. This is where the psychological becomes the physiological. And when you start the day that way, oh my gosh, our meditation's eight minutes light. You can change your day. When you talk about the ego, you know, there's somebody listening right now to this conversation and they're on the fence of a decision and they genuinely don't know if one choice is being driven by their ego. And if the other choice is being driven by the heart, because just like with me and the real estate. Yes. Fiasco, my ego did a great job of disguising itself as my heart, right? Cause I had been meditating, doing all the things. And I was telling myself a story that, oh, once I become a real estate mogul, I'll make all this money and I can help more people. I can teach, I can expose more people to meditation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, actually, indirectly, very indirectly, it, it did help me um, achieve that goal. But how does one know, how can you feel if you're listening to or hearing your ego versus your heart? That's a major question. And I think one of the fundamental um, things we need to work through in this book, because at first you say, well, is it my ego or is it my heart? It's really hard to tell the difference. So again, the science and the practices help to create that aligned communication, which leads to real clarity, light, and real stillness. You know, a lot of people think they're meditating and they're trying, but there's so many thoughts and they're really just sitting there thinking or uh, reinforcing neural patterns and pathways and sort of just in the same um, perceptions. So what's amazing about this work and doing um, the Heart Align Meditation, which I introduce in the Dark Heart, the Heart Align Harmonize Method, which you do in under a minute in the middle of your day, is that you start to turn on those 40,000 neural networks in your uh, neurons in your heart. So you change your perceptions. Your perceptions change your thoughts and your thoughts will ultimately change how you make decisions. So we're not going to the same place to find a solution as the mind. The mind says, wait a minute. Am I overthinking this? Am I my heart or my ego? And you're when you come when you turn on the heart's power and you become more coherent, there's a deeper sense of knowing. Now this gets stronger and stronger over time. So one of the things the scientists coined is this term coherence capacity. What that means is your capacity to be more resilient against stress, stay calm, grounded, level-headed, make uh, better decisions on a day-to-day -day basis increases the more you do this work. So the participants in our study, for instance, increased their coherence 29% in four weeks. I guarantee if we kept that study going in two months, their coherence would be higher and higher and higher. So the point is over time, your ability to make decisions and to know I'm in coherence and I'm making a decision from my heart versus the erratic fear patterns, old neural networks of my brain becomes more clear. I also want to read you a quote from the book. And this, of course, you know, again, as we do the work, this becomes more clear. What I write light is, does a thought or decision bring you peace? If so, it will be from the heart. Not every decision is going to feel good, 
but there will be a sense of peace. Sometimes there's a sense of pain, grief, or loss along with the peace, but underlying peace will be there always. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. Or you can think of an example. So with this, um, with this situation where I picked this business partner who ended up stealing a lot of money and, you know, wasn't really paying attention to the business. Basically I got screwed in so many ways. It wasn't peaceful. I was just angry a lot. I felt restless. When we decided to part ways, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, there was grief there. Like I really lost money and set myself back or whatever, but there was a sense of peace. Like it's, it's over now. I can move on. It was like, and I felt that in relationships with my ex. Um, and I moved out shortly after my mom passed away. It was like, oh, lots of pain and sadness, crying in the closet. But there was also a piece of like, I did something for me because I know this relationship wasn't really going anywhere. So there was peace there. Yeah, I was thinking about that when we were just talking about how when you make heart aligned decisions, you tend to find yourself in more favorable yeah. circumstances. But even when you're not in those favorable circumstances, you, you could arrive at that decision to move on, to make an adjustment, to adapt to some new change. And it's just okay. It's not the end of the world. Whereas before it was the end of the world. And what does this mean? And you're like you said, you're, you're, you're validating yourself by what you look like on paper. And, uh, and I think that's a very powerful way to move about the world. And, and you also referenced something else, and this was in stage three, which I think everybody can relate to, is kind of shifting from the need to process your decisions with someone else versus getting to a place where you can kind of feel the answer. And it's not to say that you never, because I still talk to my friends about decisions, but I'm not necessarily looking for them to validate my my choice or to even give me the answer um, because I've already come up with the answer. And, and I've written before saying that who you, who you talk to is a clue into the answer you've already chosen for yourself. Because if you're thinking of doing something that would be seen as risk averse and you talk to someone who's conservative and ask them for their advice, then you, your answer is, I don't want to take the risk because that's where they're going to, they're going to tell you to be conservative versus talking to someone who's taken a healthy amount of risks. They're going to tell you to go for it probably. And so because you went to talk to them means you've already decided you're going to take the leap. You just wanted that little extra uh, motivation or inspiration to do so. So we become these for, you know, the term that just comes to mind spontaneously, like is a heart based warrior, mm -hmm. right? I think of Hanuman. I think about these amazing figures in you know, spiritual texts and histories that are so full of courage and power going to someone else. It's kind of like how on social media, we follow people that kind of reinforce what we believe, whether that's in politics or die. So now you're, you're surrounded by like reinforcing but here's the truth. We're all on this individual journey and the way this person found success and the way this person found this or that is not going to be the same as for you. It's like when I coach people with diets as well, there's no cookie cutter. This is the best diet for everyone. Like it really is your body and your genetic inheritance and your, uh, you know, your specific body. It's like a very specific blueprint. So when we're constantly looking outside, it means that we haven't strengthened this true inner connection yet fully. It, can, it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger as we steady into the heart. The other thing you mentioned is if you're struggling, a lot of people are struggling. I struggled a lot. And I'll tell you something, there is no better time to come into this heart work than when you are in the dark heart. All of the hearts, you can keep going and going. But let me tell you something, if you can't pay your rent right now, if you're like, oh God, I just got dumped again. I just found out that person is cheating me on me again, the third person in a row. I just got screwed over. There's, first of all, I say this with compassion. We have to start to be aware that there's, this, there's some kind of darkness. There's something we're not seeing yet about ourselves. Once we can just humbly say, I want to awaken more. 
right? Yogananda says, bring the light into the cave that's been in darkness for 10,000 years. It's as if the darkness never was. This heart coherence work is like turning on light after light after light. So suddenly you can start to see a way to get out of a really shitty situation. Maybe you can apply for a job there, or maybe you can ask this person for a different work project, or maybe whatever it is, you start to perceive more. You can start to get out of the dark. You don't have to live those same patterns. So I know what it's like to be in a really low stage. And so I really want to say that, you know, like this is so much of that confusion and that fear. It doesn't have to be repeated. Yeah. And I think one of the, um, ways that we sort of process these kinds of situations is, is in a very binary way, which is, you know, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no. Or if it's not working, I need to leave the situation. And it's not, it's not always the answer. Usually it's a little bit of a gray area where maybe you just relate to that person differently, or maybe you speak your truth a little bit more. Maybe you have just healthy boundaries and you experiment with that first. And, and like you said, you know, in a work situation, maybe you put your emphasis on a different aspect of the job while you, you devote some time and resources to uh, pursuing something that you're more passionate about in the five to nine hours um, and letting your nine to five become the funding mechanism for that. So I always like to encourage people to get away from the binary black or white, good or bad, off and on approach to yes. these kinds of things. And I, and I think talking about the progression of these stages is so important for people to understand that you, you're not just going to go from, you know, stage one, the dark heart to stage five, the clear heart overnight. You got to work your way through just like you work your way through the five stages of grief when something you know, doesn't go your way. You got to get a little angry. You got to be a little depressed. You got to be in denial a little bit and you move through that. But what changes when you do this kind of work is you don't, you don't linger in those states for too long, you know, yes. you, you, and you talk about emotions and I want to kind of talk about that a little bit more with you so we can understand what we get wrong about emotions. Cause I, I remember hearing some Ted talk where someone said an emotion only really lasts I think it was like 90 seconds or three minutes or something, but we can experience that emotion for three months or three years or, you know, 30 can, years. Yeah, <laughs> indefinitely. And that's a sign that there's, there's a misalignment happening. So, so talk a little about a little bit yeah. about emotions. Cause I think a lot of people can relate to navigating, having to navigate emotions and having them linger for a very long time. Yes. And emotional intelligence is a big theme in the book because emotional intelligence is born of heart intelligence. First though, like, I wanna address what you said because that was so well said about not right or wrong, like these black and white categories, which is very much propelled heart, likes to, lots of ego, mind thinking, likes to put things in boxes. The clear heart isn't this inaccessible state. We all experience moments when you look into your dog's eyes or your child's eyes, or you just feel out of time and space. You're at an amazing concert or a sunset and you just, are in this feeling of oneness. So what these teachings do and these practices is that it's not just random once in a while. How do I get that back? It, you are actually able to increase your capacity to feel and experience those heart-based emotions and feelings more and more. In the clear heart too, I reference the Tao and where we go into that which cannot be named right? There's like a way we connect to other people. We don't have to put them in categories. You're this, you're that, you believe in this. I can't connect to you. Like, oh, I could never work there. I judge you. It's just this isness that that's real unconditional love. It's just a real connection that changes like the medicine, the highest intelligence is the unconditional love. So emotions, back to your question, are energy in motion. They're meant to move through. And so as a nutritionist, I also found this highly interesting because I've spoken about so much about digestion over the past 15 years or so. And you see what happens with stagnation when things aren't able to be processed. They create inflammation in the body. They create blockages. They keep you from really feeling the full lightness and the vitality. So then I was amazed to learn the science that we actually, emotions can be encrypted and held in your body as well. And this has been proven scientifically. So let's say there's something that happened when you were a young child and it was so overwhelming. You didn't have the tools to speak about it or 
process it. So you ended up pushing it down. So then what happens is when something that reminds you of that incident, if something goes off in your amygdala and you react or you feel that fear or something happens over and over and over again. So one of the things that I talk about in the book, the science shows that you don't want to just relive the anger over and over again. That was something Sigmund Freud first recommended. And then he later um, did uh, said, you know, this practice isn't the right way. Meaning we want to keep that um, steady anchor of the heart. There's a practice in the steady heart called steady in life where you can actually create coherence. And then you let these big sensations and emotions and waves, whether they're grief, anger, jealousy, resentment, come up and be digested through. And that's how you really process it from the heart versus going into the rage. What that does is it reinforces the neural networks. And even five minutes of anger light, the research shows, <laughs> depletes your immunity for six hours. We don't want to keep depleting ourselves. We don't want to keep hurting ourselves. So what we do is from the heart's perspective, we can process these emotions. So in the devoted heart, where I talk about forgiveness, this is a big one. First, we start working on the surface thorns. Then there's the big stuff, the big stuff. It's like a deep thorn <laughs> and then your skin works around it. As you kind of grown, we've kind of grown accustomed that this is how life is, or this is how I'm going to feel or whatever. But there's a six stage process for really, really deeply forgiving, which we may have to do in stages through the heart that can totally, totally change your energy field. And I'll say on a personal note for me, my, I used to have some grievances against my parents, like a lot of us, like, oh, I wish they paid more attention to me. They were always working. <laughs> I wish I was loved this way. I felt neglected, whatever it is. You can forgive. You really can. And then there's another stage where it's beyond forgiveness. It's like, oh, this was perfect. You know, you can say to that, really look at that person, your ex-husband that cheated on you and be like, Thank you, because I learned so much about myself or learned what I really wanted. I got so strong. If I didn't have this perfect childhood, I wouldn't have been on the seeking path. I wouldn't have been on the spiritual journey. So there's layers and layers of this emotional healing and the opening of the heart. And again, when you get to that clear heart stage and there's this oneness, like it means there's no separation. It's just what's happened and the life and the love. Yeah, you know, I've definitely had direct experiences with that where something with, other people would perceive to be negative or bad happens to me. And I'm immediately able to jump to the lesson, to jump to the silver lining, to, to, to focus my energy and attention on, on what I learned from this situation. And as you're saying, this is kind of like stage four level work. And going back to our original uh, uh topic of toxic positivity, you know, a lot of times when you express that people may accuse you of being toxically positive, but I think a healthy reminder for people is, is you don't have to really engage with that either. You can just understand, okay, that person's kind of working their way through the, their own experiences and their own um, progression with their heart. And that's what they can see right now, but, but it doesn't invalidate what you see with whatever you're experiencing in your heart. And, yes. and you talk about if you don't allow yourself to go there and, and just kind of be in the lesson of it all, it's going to feel off to you. Just like the person who's focused too much on what didn't go right. It feels off to them to focus on the lesson at that stage. So it's like, we're all kind of like doing our work at our, at our various stages. Yes. And certain things may, because of our wounds and our trauma and our past experiences of the, you know, wounding in the heart, certain things may, um, be easier for you to process than others. Right. I'm saying this for everyone. So I have a friend, for instance, whose girlfriend cheated on him and it wasn't that big a deal to him. He was like, Oh, I guess we weren't right for each other. And yet he got screwed in a business relationship and the money and the kind of the whole situation ate away at him for over a year, right? So some people, this really bothers them and then this wouldn't, or some people, this would bother, you know, so we're on, on such individual journeys. We can't really label someone as toxic positivity because we're not in their shoes. Just like we can't label someone's 
journey in general. Because when we do that, we're also dividing our, like we're, you know, highest level, we say we're all one. When you're judging someone, you're actually having a fragmented version of yourself and sort of projecting that out. If you're in, you know, whole, what you see is wholeness. And I say that in the clear heart, the light sees the light. And and that in and of itself is, I think, inner work, just refraining from judging anyone for anything and just kind of focusing on including yourself and just focusing on, just know that we're all in the process somewhere. And speaking of which, in that same chapter, The Devoted Heart, you talk about never missing out on an opportunity to serve. What do you mean by that? Yes, exactly. So sometimes we think of service and he's like, you know, kind of grandiose. I volunteered at the soup kitchen for Thanksgiving this year, or we went on a service trip to the, you know, whatever, Habitat for America. Those are great, but moment to moment like here, right? Presence, heart, face, living is moment to moment. Never miss an opportunity to serve means never miss an opportunity to connect with someone from your heart, to say the loving thing from your heart's impulse. The Maybe you could lift someone up with a smile. Maybe you could be extra kind to that barista. Maybe you could hold the door open for someone. Maybe you can intuitively feel that one of your colleagues could use a, a compliment or a kind moment, or maybe you could feel like your child needs an extra hug. Never miss an opportunity to serve it means never just go through life like an automaton, like a robot from a mind, but be in your heart. There are infinite ways we can serve moment to moment. And isn't that part of this, you know, being in the oneness is what are we putting into the field? We can, we can serve with our heart, with these heart-based emotions. We can serve with more compassion and care, unity and love, or we can kind of glide through the day autopilot. I'm hurrying here. You see the people in New York city. I used to live there. Now when I go back, it's like, everybody's just marching ahead. When you go to India, you know, like, like you look like everybody's chatting to each other. There's this presence. There's looking into people's eyes. So never miss an opportunity to serve means come right here into your heart, come right here and live here. Not just sometimes, not just when it feels good, but increasingly as we do this work, this is the real work moment to moment. And then in your final stage, the clear heart, I, I got a little um, little validation or affirmation from reading about A, affirmation mantras, but also uh, you, you mentioned embracing simplicity. This is the stage where mm. we start embracing simplicity. And, and I wrote this book about Travel spiritual life. minimalism. Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm there. I've, I've embraced simplicity. I, I've made a whole lifestyle out of not needing much more than what's in a backpack. Is that a literal interpretation or what do you what do you actually mean by embrace simplicity? The more you come into your heart light, the more simple life becomes literally across all levels. So I'll give you an example. You and me talking, we've unpacked a lot of the baggage. We've done the work. We've you know healed a lot of the triggers, re- reframed things, gotten out of our heads, all the narratives, all the stories. So there's just a conversation. I'm talking to this person. We're talking. Not all the like stuff from the past it makes things real simple. It makes your relationships real simple. It's way less drama, right? We're just here expressing our needs. By the way, the heart doesn't need to get trampled on. Boundaries, Clearly, I'm drawn to this person. I'm not drawn to hanging out to this with this person. I don't have to say yes when I don't feel like it. I'm not abandoning myself. I'm not, you know, betraying myself. And that simplicity carries through. So in my life, I used to make all these recipes and be into all this stuff. I eat so simply. I cook veggies and I make bowls. My family, our kids eat simply. We spend um, our schedules very simple and all these things to pack in. I've cleaned out so many clothes. I love in your travel light book, you talk about your uh, capsule wardrobe and things like that. You just, all these things that we thought that we needed, it's not that they're wrong, but it just fills your mind with more thoughts and more thinking and evaluating. And you know, when people start to go really down that rabbit hole of, you know, let's use the example of fashion or clothes. It's a never ending, you know, closet. You can just keep going in, spending a lot of energy and time And so it's not wrong, but it just makes things a little bit more complicated. We want to pick and choose where we spend our time and attention. And so, you know, certain things that you love, your relationships get simple, your life gets simple. For me, there's very clear buckets. There's spirituality in my 
relationship with God, on my time in meditation. There's my family. There's my work, right? Books, podcasts, Saluna, my wellness brand. And I have friends and I have, you know, wanting to travel and experiences and stuff like that, but they're further down. <laughs> and so that's really simple. I'm not trying to, you know, create, like just chase a lot of different things. You know, your buckets, there's a simplicity and there's so much joy in simplicity. It's much easier to digest. Um, and then you put your time into attention and time and attention to what matters. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. So how do you think about um, dating across stages? So someone is in clear heart. They have that sort of simple approach to life. Do you believe in this framework, do opposites attract or do you, do you naturally, because I'll, I'll just be completely 100 with you. I, I don't feel like I, I haven't attracted women who embrace simplicity in the same way. I mean, compared to other women, maybe they are embracing simplicity more, but I, you know, having been dedicated to my inner work for 30 something years and typically dating younger women than myself, I just, I don't attract that many people who I feel like are experiencing what I'm experiencing. And is that, is that something that obviously it's not a problem for me, but is that something that is that, is there a way to think about that when it comes to dating? Cause I think sometimes we may feel like if I'm attracting someone who's narcissistic or who's, you know, got all these other issues, is that a reflection of where where I am or is that just, is it just yeah. a, a thing where, you know, people are attracting what they need in order to grow to the next level or how, how do you think about all of that? So you keep saying the word think, right? Like, so when we're talking about this, we're going to go beyond thinking. Cause I think we tend to get really linear in the dating world. Like how do I write my app, my bio on the, on who am I going to swipe or thinking about this? How does this person fit into my life? And when we come into the heart, so you're talking about simplicity, when you get real clear and real coherent. So remember we talked about the heart field sometimes, and I could see this now with such clarity, your heart is in a certain level of coherence. You may think you're in a certain level of consciousness, but the energy doesn't lie, right? Your certain level of coherence, and maybe there's a pattern that's not worked out. So you may, you may attract someone that's a matching trauma or a matching pattern. So I'll give you an example. We hear about people choosing their father that they had all this trauma with or this, whatever this person, you know, your mother, whatever it is, you don't consciously want to attract that person, but there's something in the energetic field. So what I can say is this, as you keep becoming more coherent, you can see more. So when I saw my husband, I was, you know, meditating for months. I was holed up in my house. Everybody has to do this, but my mom had passed away. I went through a breakup and I just was, you know, pretty living a pretty quiet life. So I was in a lot of coherence. I met this guy like, and usually I would never date him. He's got a grill in his teeth, big meat smoker. <laughs> just like all these things. I was like, who's this guy? but there was some energetic pull. So the things that really mattered, the values, the deep loyalty, the deep devotion and commitment and this groundedness and this strength I could feel. Now, it doesn't mean we didn't have to work out things, but those are the things that were able to be worked out, right? I could see, oh, I have trauma with abandonment. And then, you know, we had a matching trauma where he like would push people away. <laughs> um, so I'll say with your thing with simplicity, that may or may not be the most important thing when you find your woman. Maybe she's so deeply in her heart and she can work on the simplicity or you can teach her that or she evolves into that. But maybe some of the other energies that you can't even say in words, the qualities will draw you in and then that will unfold. Or maybe as you just continue, you've been on this journey for 30 years, but out of time and space, right? There's just these quantum leap moments which Swami Sri Tishwar talks about as well and also the heart math science shows where you can just be in a different state and then attract a completely different person or see someone in a different way and express how important simplicity is to them. And then they open up to it. I love simplicity. 
my husband is big clutter person, <laughs> but I've expressed it and we work through things and he keeps it in his area most of the time, but the bigger things align light, you know, it's like, you can't even explain it in words. It's all energy. Can we, can we talk some about some of the um, lifestyle suggestions uh, for yes. various stages? Cause I want people to see how practical you're, you're not talking about, you know, rubbing your face in peanut butter and standing on your head for two hours and this kind of, <laughs> you're, it's just like, like go out into the sun, go into nature, you know, eat this, drink that. What, what are some of the lifestyle suggestions? Maybe as you walk us through the progression. Yes. And you would do that through. So the steps briefly of the meditation that are based on, first of all, this tensing and releasing, which is based on Yogananda's practice is just to prepare the body. There's so much tension that we hold. And when we're tense in our bodies, that tends to create tightness in your thoughts and your energy. So we simply relax the body. Then you shift to your heart, which again, research based on the American Journal of Cardiology. You take some heart-focused breaths, which I explain more in the book, what creates coherence. And then you find something that triggers this feeling of appreciation. So appreciation is a mix of gratitude, awe, approval. It's different than gratitude. And what the book showed, and for anyone watching this, I'll show a little graph. This changes how your body actually functions. It's not just like, oh, appreciation feels good. Or I heard about this. Look at this chart. When we're in appreciation, this is the easiest heart-based emotion to access. Because let's say you're saying you're frazzled or you just woke up. It's hard to go into love or peace. But this changes the neural networks. So you can do this in just two minutes. starts to create that a deeper coherence. And I'm you know, abbreviating this and you come out and you're more coherent. Five minutes light, seven minutes, boom. You changed everything for the day. So I want to say that's the most practical step. And then there's different practices throughout. And then I also uh, mentioned different foods and, um, and elixirs and herbs and things through each. So for instance, um, in the dark heart uh, and throughout, there's a lot of, um, there's a strong relationship between foods that are really great for your heart and ones that are great for your brain. So healthy fats, for instance, grounding foods, more fiber. Since we have three brains, there's one in your gut, one in your heart, and one in your head. They all work together. So there's ways in which we can eat to increase, uh, decrease inflammation. Lots of greens are really important. There's certain greens like spirulina and chlorella, which really help to strengthen your body's resilience. There's certain functional mushrooms, um, cacao, which we grow in Hawaii. The bliss chemical can help you tap into some of these expansive feelings so you can experience them and then go to increase them more and more. Um, as you mentioned, in the clear heart, we talk a lot about simplicity, sprouts, which are you know, really simple foods, but really high activations in your body, full of amino acids, grounding, connecting with nature, um, getting some sunlight on your skin, walking barefoot on the earth. I mean, this is a really practical book. So each part, there's like you're learning the teachings, you're doing the practices, and you're learning lifestyle tips so you can really live a more heart-centered life. And you also say that the intention is to awaken us to our true power so that we can contribute to a heart-based society. Give us the big picture. What's the big vision, Kimberly? What, 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 what does a heart-based society look like? How many people need oh. to be doing this kind of work? Oh man, <laughs> I'm, this is one of the reasons I, every morning, like, I'm like crying when I, when I, um, think about this. Cause I, I feel like there's many of us that are coming now together. You are, many of us are stepping in and saying, we need to change things. This is not going a good way. We know what it's like when most of society is in the dark heart. Every heart that awakens changes the world around them. So I can't quantify how many actual people, but one of the things that Swami Sri Yukteswar talks about in the Holy Science, he talks about these different ages. He talks about the dark ages. And then there's the Satya Yuga where so many people awaken. It creates a different society. I mean, can you imagine what our day-to-day -day life would be like if more people were in the devoted heart? It would be amazing. Our children would grow up in this world of connection. We wouldn't want to trample on the environment. We wouldn't want to hurt our own bodies. We wouldn't dump all these chemicals into the forests. We wouldn't hurt each other. We wouldn't have a lot of these conversations about things. They would just, um, 
you know, dissipate. It would just be so different. So I feel a real sense of urgency now because I think the only way that we're going to heal all this ego and separation in the world is through the heart. One heart at a time. This work was influenced by uh, the self-realization lineage, right? Yes. Is, I'm just curious from a technical perspective, is there, do you have to clear this with anyone or is, do they, do they appreciate people being inspired and wanting to put forth, you know, work with it and, and further the, the, um, advocacy for the heart work and for Krishna yoga, um, uh, uh, Kriya yoga and, you know, all the other practices or how does that work behind the scenes? Is there like a political thing that people <laughs> have no idea about? So I have the deepest of respect, of course, for the Self-Realization Fellowship, for Yogananda, for Heart Math. So I worked really closely with both organizations. This book is, you know, I'm not presenting myself to be you know, like a guru or the, you know, the, 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 you know, scholar on it, but this is a modern interpretation of someone in today's world taking Swami Sri Yukteswar's teachings and saying, hey, they line up with the science. So I did send, the, I worked with the Self-Realization Fellowship on the book. So they were able to check every quote for accuracy to get their take on everything. I also um, edited the book with the Heart Math Institute to make sure the science was exactly on point and all the citations were correct. Of course, we did the study together. And so um, because a lot of the research is used in the practices, they also gave permissions. So yes, with the deepest of intention, it's to further the work of these great ones, the Yogananda, um, Swami Sri Yukteswar, these very rare beings that come here to show us the way. Jesus Christ, Krishna, right? There's not so many of them that come, these avatars, but we don't want their teachings to get lost in dusty old books and, you know, bureaucracy and you know, complicated religious systems. This is to be lived. And so that's the intention of the hidden power of the five hearts is to bring their teachings forward and also to show how the science actually validates what they were saying all along. That's beautiful. Yeah. And you said you did a, a podcast exchange with the heart math, the doctor who, who founded the heart math Institute, which is awesome. I love their work. I think it's so important and so necessary. And, um, and it's it's really great to hear that the self realization fellowship is is um, also supporting your work as well. Well, I appreciate you coming on and and sharing your work. So this book comes out in a week um, on September the seventeenth, two thousand twenty four, and obviously we want as many people to go out and grab a copy as possible. And just to spread this message as far and as wide as possible. This is again, book number eight for you, which is very, very <laughs> impressive. Um, you know, people don't appreciate how much work goes into a book from inception to publication and, and marketing and all the things, but you make it look easy. And in that regard, you are my inspiration. <laughs> so uh, what else do you have associated with the book or associated with your work or platform Solana that you would like to talk about? Well, thank you so much, Light. I'm so excited to get this book out into the world, like really excited to share about the heart. And I will say that for the next week, if anyone pre-orders the book, they will automatically join our four week heart reset program, which I promise is going to be life changing. This is where I'm going to take you through each week with live Zooms, videos, uh, community interaction, how to really open your heart and um, take a quantum leap in your life. So you'll get access to that just by pre-ordering the book, as well as our Heart Awakening Vitality ebook. So there's still one week left to enter light, and I'm so excited about that as well. Amazing. And and does, is entry closed once the book comes out, or can people still That's right. Them? Okay. Um, by the 17th, it will close, and you can get information at mysaluna.com slash fiveheartsbook. Wonderful. And of course, we'll put all that in the show notes as well. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly. Looking forward to chatting again when book number nine comes out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Light. I just appreciate you and your big, warm, beautiful heart so much. I saw you the second I saw you and mm. I still see you. So thank beautiful. you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.